Hi, this is Chaplain Greg again with the Wandering Wesleyan and our Walking Through the Word series. And uh, we are picking back up in Brashit, in the beginning, the book of Genesis, and we're going through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And last week we talked about um, where we left off was Noah and how Noah had a three sons, uh, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. And uh, Ham did something pretty despicable, in exposing something, doing something with his mom. Go back if you want uh, the references for that. Um, and he was cursed, and, given, and his son Canaan was cursed. And out of that came the Canaanites, and they're going to be important as we uh, go forward in this story. But Shem actually uh, continues on. So we have this family line that we're watching here, Adam, and then Seth, and then Noah, and then Shem. Now, there may be generations in between that aren't recorded. Maybe, maybe not. We're not going to worry about that. But we're going to worry about those guys because they're important. Now, Ham had multitude of generations himself. And one of those descendants, his name was Nimrod. And Nimrod was a mighty warrior and hunter. And he founded a city called Babel or Babylon. Hmm. That's going to show up a lot through the rest of the Bible, isn't it? Even through the New Testament. Uh, the figure of Babylon. Babylon will become the figure of wickedness, the place of utter evil. And this will be symbolic throughout the Bible and actual. Babylon was a pretty horrific, awful place. And that's where our story is today. Chapter 11 in the book of Genesis, where we're going to be talking about the Tower of Babel. Now, our modern thinking says, what's so big deal about building a big tower? Don't we have big buildings all over the world? What, what's the big deal? Well, remember our Jewish cosmology from our study of creation. That the heavens were separated waters from the earth. And sky and land was where creation existed. The ancients would build these huge towers called ziggurats to try to get to the heavens because who dwelled up there? The gods. And they wanted to invite a god to come down so that they could be like God. Sound familiar? Yeah, it's a snaky thing, isn't it? It's one of the lies that the uh, Ho Satan, the snake, the the, the the evil one, the enemy, told to our first parents, you can be like they already were like God. They didn't they didn't believe it. So the whole point of building this big tower in Babel was so that they could be like God or like the gods. God says this unified culture in this unified language is not good because look at what they're doing. So God throws confusion into humanity and this confusion is through their languages and the tower project ends. And Babylon is pushed to the side for a little while. It's gonna come back. Now, this confusion with languages and this dispersing of people because of the languages, when we get to Acts chapter 2, and when the Holy Spirit is sent, and those that were in the upper room receive the Holy Spirit and go out preaching and, and teaching in what the Bible calls tongues or other languages, and other people hear and understand what's being said, even though they're not used to having their language spoken there. This sort of reverses that. 
And when we get to Acts, we'll talk about that. So that's the first section of Genesis, chapters 1 through 11. Now, chapters 12 through 50, we're going to be concentrating on uh, one single family. And it's from that line of Adam to Seth to Noah to Shem. And one of Shem's descendants is named Abram. Now, he was Abram before Abraham, descended from Seth. And Abram was married to a woman by the name of Sarai. And Abram receives a visit, visitation from God. And when we go to chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we see what God asks Abram to do. He says, go from your land, your relatives, your father's house, to the land I will show you. He doesn't know where he's going yet. I'm going to show you. You just got to go. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Remember that. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Let me repeat that. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now remember... In Genesis 3.15, God gave a promise to Eve that one of her descendants would crush the enemy's head, but his heel would be bruised by the snake, the wounded healer. We're seeing that line, and God has chosen Abraham and his family to be the deliverer of salvation to the world not just to the Jews, not just to one family, but to the world, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham decides to leave. Now, one of the things that God said, if you remember what I, from what I just read, go into your land, go from your land and your relatives. Abraham makes a number of mistakes along the way, and I am so thankful. I am so thankful that we have a Bible that shows its heroes as being messy, as making mistakes. And one of the big mistakes he makes is that he kind of disobeys God and brings his nephew Lot with him. Go from the land and your relatives. Well, Lot, come on along with me. He shouldn't have done that. As we read through, uh, Abraham diverts to Egypt but he returns back to the land of what? Canaan. Yes, Canaan is where Abram eventually winds up. And uh, we have, in, uh, I just read the Abrahamic covenant in chapter 12. Uh, he returns to Canaan with his nephew Lot and they realize they can't exist together. They're both doing very well. Their flocks are, are just expanding and... And they're doing very well, but they can't live together. So Abraham shows Lot uh, two sides of Canaan. One is arid and dry and dusty, and the other is green and flourishing and wonderful. And Lot says, I'm going to go to the green and flourishing one. You take the dusty one. Well, Lot kind of, Lot kind of doesn't do a good job with that because he goes into the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, here's the thing about Sodom and Gomorrah. We get all uptight about certain sexual practices that were happening at Sodom and Gomorrah. That was just the tip of the iceberg. These were very, very evil cities. Think about the world that Noah lived in before the flood. That's kind of what these cities were about. Sodom and Gomorrah further represents the evil that is encompassing the world and the evil that has descended from Ham. And Lot eventually witnesses, with his back turned, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot disappears from the narrative after that. So when we get to chapter 15 of Genesis, we get to a very important chapter. And 
this is important because we're going to have another promise given to Abram. So in verse 4, he is going to promise, God is going to promise Abram an heir. Now they're pretty old, Abram and Sarai. They're pretty old. But God says, this one, meaning their heir, will not be your heir. Now, who is he talking about? This one will not be your heir. Again, life is messy. In a second, we're going to talk about how God tries, uh, how Abram tries to circumvent God's promise by doing it himself. And so, in chapter 15, God is promising Abram that he's going to have an heir, that his family line will continue. But when we get to chapter 16, we see what God was talking about, about this one not being your heir. Because Abram and Sarai try to circumvent God's promise by doing it their own way. And Sarah gives Abraham her slave named Hagar. And Abraham sleeps with Hagar and Ishmael is born. Ishmael is not the heir. And if you, when you read Galatians, Paul talks about this. That Ishmael is the son of the flesh. Whereas Isaac, who is coming, is the son of the promise. God is going to keep his promises. He will keep his promises, but we mess it up so many times when we try to do it ourselves. So chapter 16, we have Ishmael. Chapter 17 in Genesis comes up and Abraham is now 99 years old. And God speaks to him again and he says, I am the God Almighty. Live in my presence and be blameless. I will set up my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you greatly. Oh, beautiful promise. Then Abraham fell face down on verse 3 and God spoke to him, As for me, here's my covenant with you. And this is so important. You will become the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, but you will be Abraham, which is a more formal way of saying the father of nations. For I will make you the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. You will make nations and kings will come from you. I will confirm my covenant that is between me and you and your future offspring. throughout their generations. It is a permanent covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring after you. And to you and to your future offspring, I will give the land where you are residing, all the land of Canaan, as a permanent possession, and I will be their God. That is the Abrahamic promise. I will be your God you will be my people. As long as I remain your God, you will be my people. His name is changed to Abraham. And later on, later on Sarah's name, Sarai's name is changed to Sarah. Hagar and Ishmael still need to deal with that. Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. Now we come up with Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed. God is demonstrating that he wants to remove sin from his presence. Abraham and his descendants and his family, his direct family of the promise, are God's people. And God said, you need to be blameless before me. Eventually, Sarah does become pregnant, and I'm skipping a lot here, but I'm sticking with the narrative because this is what I want you to see. I want you to see the continuous narrative that flows through all these books in the Bible. 
So Sarah does get pregnant, and she does have a son, and they name him Isaac. So now we have Adam, Seth, Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac. We're moving down. God calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. That's in chapter 22. Can you imagine that? This God who made you this promise is saying, now I want you to go up and sacrifice your son on this mountain. Abraham's obedient. And he goes up there. And he makes an altar. And he puts his son on the altar. And as he's raising the knife to make the sacrifice, God stops him. No. Don't do it. Why would God do something like this? For a couple of reasons. First of all, a kind of a practical one. He is telling the Canaanites, child sacrifice is not okay. It's not of God. It is evil. You can't do this. The other thing he's showing is that it's going to take a great sacrifice to cleanse humanity. It's a foreshadowing of what's going to happen with Jesus. God stopped the knife with Abraham. He didn't stop it with his own son. We'll talk about that when we get to the Gospels. The other part that's really important about this story is where it happened and the mountain that it happened the mountain where it happened was a place where a town called Jabus Salam formed it was called Salem for a while and then the people called the Jabus moved in there and it became eventually when David conquered it Jerusalem on that spot and right now there's a mosque on that spot but before that before 70 AD there was the temple there the Jewish temple and we're getting way ahead of ourselves but I just want to give you some context around where that happened Hagar and Ishmael are sent away Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed God calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac Holds back the knife. Isaac is raised. And he has a wife named Rebecca. From, from uh, Abraham and Sarah's family. Rebecca has twins. Jacob and Esau. And next week we're going to talk about the twins. Jacob and Esau. But until then, this is Chaplain Greg. I'm so glad that you're watching. If you like it what you're seeing please like the video subscribe uh share it i'd love if you shared it with other people um if people are interested in, in learning about this meta narrative this this long thread of story that goes through the bible um i'd love for you to share this so until then i'll see you next week be blessed